A race against time. Rescue efforts continue in eastern Taiwan after the strongest earthquake to hit a country in 25 years. Counting the costs, around Taiwan, buildings are badly damaged, with some people waiting to return home. We take a look at how war games are influencing U.S. policy in preparations for a possible war in the Taiwan Strait. Plus, I meet the army craftsman who fought bureaucracy to keep his indigenous community's traditions alive. A warm welcome to Time Plus News, I'm Betty Chen. The search is continuing for survivors of the strongest earthquake to hit Taiwan in 25 years. The 7.2 magnitude quake on Wednesday left at least nine people dead and over a thousand others injured. Rescue teams are focusing on Hualien in the country's east, where dozens of buildings have collapsed and roads and tunnels have been destroyed. Rick Cloward is live for us in Hualien City. Rick, could you please describe the situation on the ground for us? Well, aftershocks have continued throughout the day here in Hualien. That's as efforts are made across the city to make safe damaged buildings and to clear debris from the road. As the sky grows dark here, many people are now considering how they're going to spend the night. We've heard that there's going to be an uptick in people seeking to stay in shelters around the city tonight. That's after spending a restless night at home during many, many aftershocks. People all over this city are counting the cost of this big quake. Take a look at this. Given 15 minutes to pack up their lives, a day after Taiwan's massive earthquake, these residents in the eastern city of Hualien dash to collect belongings from their homes, deemed unsafe and likely facing demolition. This 25-year-old has lived here with her family for the last seven years. <laughs> Measuring 7.2 magnitude, the midweek quake was the worst to hit the country in 25 years, damaging roads, bridges, tunnels and buildings. At least 10 people were killed and dozens injured. This building in the centre of the city housed 77 people. When it was built 30 years ago, it conformed to safety standards of the time. But building regulations were dramatically reformed after the last large quake in 1999, a disaster which took more than 2,000 lives. Hualien is a port city tucked between Taiwan's central mountain range and the Pacific Ocean. Its 100,000 people rely on only two roads and a railway line to connect it to the capital, Taipei, the country's economic centre. All transport has been disrupted by the massive quake, making travel difficult on the eve of an important national holiday, when many people in the cities head back to their hometowns to spend time with their families. In the mountains around the city, search and rescue operations continue to find those trapped by landslides. Residents are seizing the chance to grab what they can with the time given to them. But they say it's not long enough to fully take account of their losses. As you mentioned, the death toll in this quake has recently risen. One more hiker in Taroko National Park, not far from this city, Hualien, has been confirmed dead. There's still 600 people stranded in Taroko Gorge there and we've been seeing dramatic footage of people being rescued by emergency services here walking over landslides that have taken out roads in that national park and it's in these mountainous areas around this city where most of the fatalities in this quake have occurred. There's still people trapped in the mountains there so the search and rescue operations are going to continue into the night. Thank you, Rick. That was Rick Gloward live for us in Hualien, Taiwan. The massive earthquake has caused severe damage across Taiwan, including in areas far from the epicenter in Hualien. John Van Trieste looks at how the rest of the country has held up. In the heart of Taipei, not far from City Hall, debris falls from a construction site, shaken loose by Wednesday morning's magnitude 7.2 earthquake. Taipei is more than 100 kilometers from the epicenter of the earthquake in Hualien, but violent shaking damaged several buildings in the city. 
This cluster of 10 buildings is among the worst hit. The 50 households living here are sheltering at a nearby school, and structural experts are not optimistic about the building's chances of repair. There were similar scenes in neighboring New Taipei, too. 157 people evacuated from this building, which had started to lean. They've been placed in hotels and other temporary accommodation, with the city's mayor promising thorough repairs. And the collapse of a mountain slope exposed the foundations of these buildings. Construction crews are reinforcing them with concrete blocks, but officials think there's a chance at least some of the 500 households in this neighborhood will need to evacuate too. There were also injuries. Rescuers pulled out four people trapped in a collapsed factory, and two workers in Taipei were severely burned when the earthquake tipped over a vat of chemicals. Central Taiwan saw damage too. Rock slides on this mountain road in Taichung trapped 21 and injured others. Firefighters were left to rescue them on foot. And in the city of Yuanlin in Zhanghua County, falling debris from a residential building damaged cars. Aftershocks continue to rock much of the country, meaning the final tally of damage and destruction may continue to climb. Dolphine Chen and John Van Trieste for Taiwan Plus. Taiwan's military has rescued six people from mines in Hualien in eastern Taiwan. Boulders blocked the roads leading to the mountainside mines after Wednesday's magnitude 7.2 quake. Rescuers used helicopters to airlift the stranded people. Some of the rescued miners sustained injuries and were sent for treatment. One miner in the area was killed in the earthquake and one remains missing. Transit workers moved quickly to restore Taiwan's transportation system after Wednesday's earthquake, which fell right before a major national holiday. Tiffany Wong reports from Taipei Main Station. Most of Taiwan's transit systems have been restored after Wednesday's 7.2 magnitude earthquake, and many people are looking to take train and high-speed rail here. Now, that's because it's the start of a long weekend in Taiwan, with the Qingming Tomb Sweeping Festival and Children's Day coinciding, um, and lots of people are trying to get back home to be with their families. Now, trains to Hualien near the epicenter of the quake uh, have been restored, but some people say that they still don't dare to get too close to the center. Yeah, we were planning to go to Hualien and to visit Taroko National Park, um, but the park is closed for the next week, so we changed our plans to go to Elon instead. Others braved the trip on the rails out of Hualien, <laughs> even as they felt constant aftershocks. Yeah, the train was safe this morning, except going under the tunnels, which were in the mountain area where the, near the uh, Taraco Gorge. It was very uh, unnerving because you could still feel the tremors. The highway from Ilan to Hualien is still blocked by landslide debris, and officials say that could take days to clear. But people traveling to the west coast, um, the opposite side of Taiwan from where the earthquake happened, say that they're not too worried about any more travel interruptions. Now, as the country's transit systems are restored, um, people are looking forward to the long holiday ahead and also getting back to life as normal. Ryan Wu and Tiffany Wong in Taipei for Taiwan Plus. Taiwan's Northern Science Park evacuated all staff Wednesday morning following the earthquake, and some companies halted production lines as a precaution. The park houses over 400 high-tech firms, including leading chip maker TSMC. Following inspections, TSMC said a small number of tools were damaged, but none of their critical ones. To discuss the earthquake's impact on a global chip supply, which heavily relies on Taiwan, our reporter Joyce Zeng spoke to Vice Chair of Tech Insights Dan Hutchison. Following the earthquake here, tech firms like TSMC, NVIDIA and Foxconn have reported minimal or no damages to their systems. But are you expecting some business impact from the temporary shutdown of some production? I'm actually not expecting a lot because a lot's been learned. I mean, in the 1999 earthquake, uh, 
was a real disaster. I mean, after facilities were really shut down for several weeks, and it took a long time before they could even get back into the fabs because some of the gas lines had broken and leaked out. Today, it's a lot better. They have a lot better protocols. They learned a lot from that earthquake. You make sure all the equipment is properly bolted down, and you build it to earthquake standards to be able to do a seven or an eight uh, Richter scale. As you're describing, there's quite a big difference in the impact and recovery between the September 1999 quake and this one. What is your biggest impression from TSMC's response um, this time? So much of the world relies on TSMC today, and, and Taiwan is a, is a center of global manufacturing. And they know that. And they also know that because the world relies on them, they have to be really, really perfect in terms of how they handle this and make sure they don't have uh, a disruption. And the one thing that I've noticed, particularly with TSMC in uh, the last 10 years, is how they've become much more conservative in terms of these sort, sort of supply chain risks that they're willing to take. And I think the fact that TSMC could report they were up at 70 percent is amazing because I remember in 99, there were fabs that were they couldn't get even get into the fab for a week or two. So it just shows you how much progress they've made in, in terms of, of the safety and, and supply chain security of the fab and the safety to the employees too. Often concerns about TSMC and Taiwan's chip supply focuses on China's threat to invade Taiwan. But of course, Taiwan is prone to typhoons and earthquakes. Does this earthquake add to or change concerns about supply chains? I mean, we've known this. I mean, if you knew anything about the history of Taiwan and whatnot, you would have known about the 1999 earthquake. And so it's not like this is a big change. We've known about the earthquake when people were talking about moving, you know, like getting TSMC to move to Arizona or to move to Japan. Earthquakes were part of the equation there. But it is important for them to diversify uh, in order to maintain the confidence, because the worst thing would be is if they lost, if the world lost confidence in them. I don't think that this uh, earthquake has shaken the confidence in TSMC's ability to supply the world's semiconductors. That was Joy Sung speaking with Dan Hutchison, Vice Chair of Tech Insights. Coming up after the break, another Taiwan athlete is heading to the Paris Olympics. Find out who when we come back. Start your weekend with a cup of coffee and a moment to reflect on what happened this week. Hello and welcome. We've got you covered from defense and politics to high tech and the arts. Not just to Taiwan, the whole world is watching. You make the coffee, we, we make, make the, the news. news. Here's what happened on Taiwan Plus. I'm Joyce Sun in Bangkok, Thailand, and you're watching Taiwan Plus News, a voice of freedom in Asia. In the face of adversity, the power of truth. Roadmap for a just and open world. Charted by the freest country in Asia. Five, four, three, two. A warm welcome to Taiwan Plus News. I'm Ian Kavat. Taiwanese semiconductor so giant TSMC. Public buses to be electric by 2030. A mission that begins with listening. And telling the stories of Taiwan. In Taipei for Taiwan Plus. Drawing insight from original thinkers. And sharing it with the world. Taiwan Plus News. A voice of freedom in Asia.
Welcome back. You're watching Taiwan Plus News. What would happen if China invaded Taiwan? Well, experts from a U.S. think tank in Washington, D.C. have developed a war game that looks at the most likely possibilities. Taiwan Plus was given exclusive access. Haimei Khan reports in this two-part series. The year is 2026, and China has decided to invade Taiwan. That's the scenario in this war game being run by a think tank in Washington, D.C. For decades, Beijing has threatened to bring Taiwan under its control and hasn't ruled out a full-scale invasion to do so. That's why security officials and analysts use war games like this one to simulate different scenarios and see how a conflict could play out. But when we put this invasion scenario together, our argument was that this was not necessarily going to be the future, but because of the Chinese military buildup and its rhetoric, it was plausible to look at invasion. Mark Kansian is a retired colonel from the U.S. Marine Corps and one of the leads of this project. He says concerns over a possible war in the Taiwan Strait motivated him to develop this war game to provide insights on how to both prevent and prepare for a potential conflict. That there's tremendous interest in Taiwan and a possible U.S.-China conflict over Taiwan. So the opportunity to, to provide an analysis, a war game that could look at this in depth over many iterations, many different scenarios arose and that's where this uh, project came from. So the United States can use uh, Kadena. Uh, there are three Kadena. boards on the table, one that shows Chinese forces, one with a map of Taiwan, and another with U.S. and Japan forces. The game uses different colored pieces to represent the different militaries and their weapon systems. What you see here uh, is a map of Taiwan, and the green units are the Taiwanese army. This is where they actually are. You can see that most of their combat power is up in the north near the capital. The game is set up to align each military's pieces with its arsenal, and with a move from China, the game begins. Each turn or roll of the dice translates to just over three days of real-life conflict. In this demonstration, Mark and his team are playing out the base case scenario, or what they say is most likely to happen, and the simulation makes four assumptions. Number one, China has decided to launch an all-out amphibious invasion. Number two, Taiwan resists vigorously. Number three, the U.S. intervenes immediately. And four, Japan allows the U.S. to operate from bases within its territory. With Team China waiting to make their move and Team U.S.-Japan-Taiwan standing by to defend, the stage is set for a preview of what hopefully will never turn into reality. Devin Tsai, Eric Tsai and Hami Okan for Taiwan Plus. That was part one of our series on war games, simulating how China could invade Taiwan. Tune in tomorrow for part two, where we find out if Taiwan could defend itself. A top U.S. diplomat has made a rare connection between the AUKUS submarine pact and Taiwan. Speaking at a think tank in Washington, D.C., Deputy Secretary of State Kurt Campbell says that new submarine capabilities would enhance peace and stability in areas such as the Taiwan Strait. Campbell also expressed the importance of working closely with other countries to increase deterrence. China has previously called the AUKUS Pact a dangerous arms race, and AUKUS is made up of the U.S., the U.K., and Australia. None of those countries have pledged to help Taiwan directly in the event of a conflict. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has criticized Israel's explanation for an airstrike that killed seven aid workers in Gaza. Uh, we need to have accountability for how it's occurred. And what isn't good enough is the statements that have been made, including that uh, this is just a product of war. An Australian citizen was among workers from World Central Kitchen killed when their convoy was hit in an Israeli airstrike. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said the workers were targeted by mistake and that, quote, this happens in war, sparking international outrage. Albanese said a clearly marked aid vehicle should not have been at risk and demanded full accountability. Israeli's military have promised an independent investigation into the strike. 
Taiwan's weightlifting star Guo Xingchun has punched her ticket to the Paris Olympics. Guo has been announced as the latest representative for the country at the Summer Games. The 31-year-old is from Taiwan's indigenous Amis people and is known as the goddess of weightlifting in Taiwan. Guo is a four-time world champion, a two-time Asian Games champion, and a four-time Asian champion. At the 2020 Olympics in Japan, she lifted a combined total of 235 kilograms in her category, securing Taiwan's first gold medal in the sport. Indigenous cultures across Taiwan often face existential threats to their customs and languages. Our reporter Reese Ears meets one craftsman from the Indigenous Amis group looking to safeguard the traditional building and weaving techniques of his people. In a house he built with his own two hands, weaver Chen Hao Yi, named Akach in his indigenous language, painstakingly crafts baskets and accessories using materials he foraged from the woods nearby, using age-old techniques passed down through generations. Chen belongs to the Amis, the largest of Taiwan's 16 indigenous groups. He lives in the town of Chenggong, wedged between mountains and sea on Taiwan's southeast coast. Chen's been studying traditional Amis crafts since 2011, learning everything he knows from community elders. His dedication culminated in an ambitious building project that began in 2018. Chen's initial motivation for the project was quite simple. He needed an Amis-style structure as his workshop, but over time, he began to realize the importance of protecting and passing on traditions. But Chen says more and more young people in indigenous communities across Taiwan are leaving their ancestral homes to pursue better economic opportunities elsewhere. Constructions like Chen's workshop are traditionally community projects in Ami's culture. So he recruited volunteers online to help him build and took the opportunity to pass on some of the traditional techniques. During that entire process, uh, how he, he, I got, he brought me to the mountains to see, so I get to see a more full picture of the culture here, not just the house building process. And that really captivated me. Chen's project wasn't without challenges though. Various forestry and conservation laws limit indigenous people's rights to gather resources from the land something they did for centuries before the island was settled by immigrants from China. Though a 2019 amendment allowed Chen to apply for foraging permits and eventually finish the project in 2020. Chen's work wasn't over when he finished building this house. He continued putting his weaving skills to work by producing traditional army's crafts like this hunting basket. Chen's work even caught the attention of the local museum, which dedicated an exhibition to his building and even helped source funding when a 2023 typhoon destroyed much of its roof. Despite concerns about shrinking communities, the support Chen has received keeps him optimistic about the future of his culture. Now, with help from assistant Hao En, Chen sells his creations online and continues the transfer of knowledge that will help sustain the traditions of his people for generations to come. Leon Lian and Reese Ayres in Taidong County for Taiwan Plus. 
An initiative in Yunlin County is working to reduce air pollution during festivals in Taiwan by providing a truck to collect money offerings. With the Tomb Sweeping Festival, a time when people pay respects to their ancestors at their tomb, it's expected that many people will burn fake paper money as offerings to the dead. The collection service aims to collect and burn money offerings for locals, helping create more smoke-free areas. 那在去年度一年整年下来,那总共有220吨的一个精子数量 South Koreans are saying goodbye to the first giant panda born in a country before she leaves for China. Born at a zoo in South Korea in 2020, Fu Bao is the product of China's panda diplomacy. Beijing sent her parents on loan to the country in 2016, and they produced two more cups last year. Cherry onlookers brave rainy weather to bid Fu Bao farewell, with many hoping they'd get to see her again. Thank you for watching Taiwan Plus News. Finally, today we leave you with images from the Blossom Kite Festival in Washington, D.C. I'm Betty Chen. Take care and see you next time.